Hi, and welcome to a brief introduction to using X1PXRF. We're going to review the basic software features for obtaining spectrum and just a little bit of analysis. The first thing we want to do, assuming your tracer is plugged in, is open a spectrum that comes from the same model. This means same detector, uh, same, uh, same rhodium tube, uh, generally speaking, something that's going to allow us to insert the presets into this software. Here, the minute I hit File, PDZ Preview, I immediately get a menu that has Spectre for my unit. If I wanted to find a new Spectrum, I would select Path and navigate to another folder where I can see what is present. In any case, following this, I am going to try and connect my device. Now in this case, I know which COM port it's plugged into, but if you don't know, you can check up here to download port and then look for the, for, for the COM port you have. In this case, my tracer is plugged into COM9. I'm going to insert a wrong value to simulate what would happen when you have an incorrect value. So here I've replaced 9 with 7. I click OK. No valid response was received from this instrument. If you see this error, click abort, review your, your COM port, and see if you can and, and verify that it is correct. If you're not sure, you can always go to Settings, Control Panel, and then find Devices and Printers. If you use Windows 7 and you're lucky enough to still have your start bar, you can find Devices and Printers as one of the, the default options available in the start bar. I open up devices and printers, I scroll down, and I see prolific USB to serial COM port. This refers to the adapter that connects the serial port on the tracer cord to the USB drive of your computer. In this case, it's plugged into COM9. So I will enter COM port 9 into this selection. When I select 9, I click OK. And I'm automatically connected to the tracer. You can see that via the green the green bubble here. Now, if I'm if I want to disconnect, I can click the green bubble, and you see the start button go away. If I want to reconnect, and I've already got the proper uh, port, which is COM9, and baud rate for this model of tracer, the Tracer 3SD, it's 115,000. I can just click on the red button, and it turns green. Next, I'm going to go to Setup and Instrument Setup. These are the presets that I've introduced by adding a background spectra over here. So I do not want to change any of these options. To the right are two options, Backscatter and PC Trigger. Backscatter is a great safety feature to have on when you're analyzing metal alloys. However, if you're analyzing ceramics, manuscripts, mounted paintings, or other objects where you're not always dealing with metals, you'll want to leave it uncovered to prevent your analysis from being uh, otherwise affected. Backscatter will automatically turn off your tracer's tube if, you are send, uh, if, if, you, if it doesn't detect uh, the vast majority of those photons returning back. You do want to select PC Trigger to make the computer control the tracer. Then I click Done. Next, I come to Tube, KTI Tube, and Read. Here, I'm going to evaluate uh, what energies and currents I want to select for my tracer. Right now, I'm running at 40 keV and 32 microamps. Here, you see me running at 40 keV and 32 microamps. I want to turn down the light just by turning to a lower current. Generally, the energy determines which elements you can see. The current determines how many photons per second you're sending out too many photons and you start overwhelming your detector. Too few and it takes a very long time to accumulate. I want to find something nice and in the middle. If you are in doubt, I recommend erring on the side of a lighter current. So I select 40 and 10 and I verify that my energy and current are the same as I, what I wish. So here I see 40 and here I see 10. If I want to analyze at 15 and 23, I can select that radio button. And then I look to verify and see that it changes to 15 and 23. For this analysis, I do want to stick with 40 and 10. 
So I'll verify that I obtained 40 and 10. And once I'm done, I will click OK. Now I'm actually ready to analyze. I'm going to put an iPhone on the screen here, or on the nose of the instrument. Now there's a couple ways to do this. The first is I can just simply hit first home and then start. And this will bring up and slowly accumulate a spectra. You can see the seconds counting over here. You can see the raw and valid count rates. In this case, I'm counting out to about, uh, uh, I'm getting a total count of between 6 and 7,000 photons per second. Note the shape of the curve here. We'll go into a little more depth as to why this is important. I'm going to go ahead and select stop. I can also, and this is generally recommended, run a timed assay. I'm going to call this, I'm going to run it for 30 seconds, OK. We're going to call this iPhone Red Filter. Now, instead of counting up, we're counting down. As this is analyzing, we're next going to move in and check out a few other features This include, uh, uh, to make the most of your tracer, and that's going to include filter adjustments. And so here we're counting down. And when we're done, you will see this area turn black. Now here, just to show you, let's say I want to see which element these two elements these, the, are here. I select ID, ELEM, and, I, uh, and I'm going to start with iron, which is way over here, but clearly these are not iron. So then I can click Z+, plus, which is going to bring me up one proton, or one element, at a time. So not selenium, not bromine, not krypton, not rubidium, but there we go, strontium. If I click Add, you will see strontium labeled above here. If I want to see what this peak is, Z+, plus, Z+, plus, voila. I see a peak here and a second peak here. I click Add, and there I have zirconium. If I keep going, note that this peak I'm not able to capture quite yet. That peak is actually a Compton peak. This is, what ha this is known as the uh, il uh, the inelastic scatter. In other words, scatter from the tube that loses a bit of energy as it bounces off of, ele uh, uh, of electron shells within your uh, sample. Here is the rhodium K alpha. And for the record, I'm using a rhodium tube. This is the elastic scatter where very little energy is lost when the uh, photons from the tube interact with the matrix. They bounce back elastically into the detector without losing any energy. And as a consequence, I see a clear, uh, uh, a, a, a clear signal from that tube. To the right of this is palladium, the collimator for this particular instrument that's located over the, det the detector. And if I keep going, I see that this big peak is tin. Now what I'm going to do is I want to compare this iPhone spectrum using a different filter. And while you cannot see what I'm doing here, I'm removing the red filter that I used to take this data, and I'm going to replace it with a yellow filter. So I select the yellow filter, put it in the instrument, replace my sample on top. Now to compare spectra I'm going to go to setup, spectrum overlay and I want to move A to B. Note that here my current spectrum is red. It's in the A channel. Think of A for active. When I select move A to B you'll notice it now turns blue. Think of it as blue for the B channel. You see it's A over B. What I want to do next is has come up to timed, timed assay, 30 seconds, and I'm going to type in iPhone yellow filter. Save. 
Now I begin accumulating a spectra using a yellow filter. Once again, it's counting down from 30 seconds. Note how fast it is accumulating. If you look down here, I have almost twice the count rate. Earlier I had 7,000. Now I've got a little over 13,000. And as a consequence, you'll see I'm gathering many more photons than I was earlier. What I'll do next is I'll pick a point to normalize. In this case, I'm going to select rhodium for comparison. I come up here to normalize, and that normalizes the two spectrum. Now I can look and see the effect the filters have. Look at how high my tin line is way out here. Generally, the heavier the duty the filter you use, the better you're going to fluoresce elements that are upstream or above 20 keV relative to rhodium, which in this case is, is our x-ray tube. If you look at our Compton, Compton peak, they match. But then look what happens here. Follow the blue line and see how it cups underneath the red line. This is the, entirely the effect of the filter. The filter is in effect attenuate, is attenuating heavily uh, uh, the white. And as a consequence, you see this drop in the background. The goal of the filter is to drop the background to a minimum at, the point of in, at a certain point of, in, of intersection with the x-axis where there are elements I'm interested in seeing. So you see where the red filter comes in and intersects at about 9.5 keV. This happens right in front of that element, that little it's bitsy red peak there, which if I click Z minus is shown to be the K beta of zinc, which is next to a little bit of copper. Now, I like to think of this as a surfer and the light as a wave. The light over here is your, is your wave. And where's the best place for a surfer? Well, a surfer is going to enjoy a spot right in front of the wave so that that energy pushes that surfer forward. Here, the red line intersects with the X axis at about 9.5 keV. So here's the best place for that surfer. In blue, with a heavier duty filter, that intersection point is at 11 keV. So I will see elements better in this range as well. In any case, this is just a very brief introduction to the basic operations of S1PXRF and how to start taking a look at spectra. Other videos will cover, will, will cover other aspects of both spectral interpretation and data gathering, but for now, hopefully this will get you started to begin comparing your data and selecting what parameters may be best. Thank you very much, and have a good day.